Armas House in Texas. He was not particularly pleased by that. If a piece of debris does survive re-entry, it travels at subsonic speeds of 120 miles per hour until it hits the ground. There was a re-entry that came in to uh, Cape Town, in South Africa. It was during the day. There were people out working in fields. They heard a sonic boom, and they looked up, and they basically saw this material coming down. The Aerospace Corporation in El Segundo, California, is a facility that collects and studies space junk for the military and private companies. This is a piece of what was once a piece of space junk. This was a part of a rocket stage that was used to put a GPS satellite in orbit. And here you can see the brackets that were actually melted off as this came down. Uh, we actually have cut samples here to try to understand what happened in this area how hot did it get? And we use that information to improve our models. Understanding how these pieces survive re-entry is important for future spacecraft and satellite construction. Recovering and reusing critical spacecraft parts could save millions in manufacturing costs. However, collecting space debris remains tricky. Three quarters of the Earth's surface is water, so a lot of it lands in the water. So when you find a piece on the ground, it's actually a very rare event. It's estimated the amount of space debris will double by 2050. But that hasn't deterred entrepreneurs who continue to explore Earth orbit as a business location. For a mere $2,500, Memorial Space Flights, which began service in 2008, will launch ashes of a loved one into low Earth orbit. It's a fitting end to anyone who dreamed of one day visiting outer space. This is just one of the many ideas entrepreneurs are developing for Earth orbit. But to run a business in space, there needs to be a way to obtain permanent occupancy. Here we are in the early years of the 21st century, and I foresee space becoming an industrial park. Skylab, Mir, and now the International Space Station have all provided an arena for long-term habitation and experiments in space. What if private companies could also have spacecraft orbiting the Earth? I think we were and are the first company to have deployed that kind of structure. Just off the Las Vegas Strip, Bob Bigelow and his team at Bigelow Aerospace are hunkered down in a high security facility creating a new generation of spacecraft. I'm living out a childhood fantasy is what it is. And I think that we are involved in something really important. Private industry is exploring the opportunities of our edge of space. Bigelow Aerospace is developing inflating workspaces called Genesis to launch into Earth orbit. The technology was inspired by NASA. I came across an article about a technology that NASA had been working on, and I thought, oh my god, this is great. NASA developed an inflatable module, a room called the TransHab, that was going to be joined to the space station to provide more living space. NASA was never able to afford executing that plan. Eventually, after a number of years, we acquired the licenses from NASA for their patents. The concept is ingenious. Bigelow spacecraft are inflatable pods that tuck into the nose of an unmanned rocket during launch, then expand to three times their travel size to full capacity once released into orbit. In a rocket fairing, you only have so much volume. 
so much room. Like this bottle. That's as big as it gets. That's it. But if you launch something in that volume that can later expand to three times its size, you have a lot more room to do something with. We use compressed gas to expand it into its form. The inflatable spacecraft can be adapted to whatever a client might need. Research laboratory, manufacturing facility, hotel space, all emerging industries for Earth orbit. We can host a variety of different kinds of clients, and they only have to pay for the specific time that they're interested in. The spacecraft is assembled from very durable but bendable materials called soft goods systems. You've driven all your life on soft goods. You've driven on tires. The inflatable systems can be extremely reliable and very strong. Bigelow's not worried about the reliability of his launch system. The Neper 18 rockets he's using are the same ones the Russians trust with some of their most precious payloads. They have about 1,100 of those rockets with nuclear missiles on them right now. We're not going to fail because the rocket failed. Once in orbit, instrumentation is powered by four solar panels, just like the International Space Station. The Genesis spacecraft is a new generation of space station, and it might be a vast improvement from the government issue brand. What we're working on, if we're successful, is a much safer vessel for humans to be in than the aluminum cans are. Our inflatable hull structure is adequate to protect against any type of thermal effects, micrometeoroid protection, radiation effects. Bigelow Aerospace now has two private spacecraft, Genesis 1 and 2, orbiting 340 miles above Earth the only privately owned spacecraft of their kind orbiting in the edge of space. Launching spacecraft into Earth orbit is only one challenge. Picking an appropriate inclination for its orbits is another. The orientation of an orbit really is just a measure of the degree of tilt from the line running through the equator. You can have anything from zero degree inclination to 90 degree inclination. The zero degree inclination is absolutely no tilt whatsoever from the equator, and that is called an equatorial orbit. Whereas if you have a 90 degree tilt from the equator, that is the polar orbit. Satellites and spacecraft are launched into different inclinations, depending on their mission, because different inclinations pass over different parts of Earth. If you're going around the Earth, around the equator, what do you get to see? It's just what's below you, which is going to be what? The equator. So an inclination of the orbit at, say, 56 degrees covers almost all of the population of the Earth. A polar orbit satellite has the ability to view the entire Earth in a few orbital rotations. As the Earth slowly rotates below, the satellite keeps sweeping overhead, allowing the entire Earth to be observed in a short period of time. If the mission is for espionage or observation, sun-synchronous orbits allow satellites to pass over the same point on Earth at the same time every day. They shift one degree each Earth day to stay in sync with the sun at a given location. If constant communication is necessary, geosynchronous satellites are positioned far away from Earth so that entire continents are within their view. It matches the rotation of the Earth and appears to hover in the sky. It's a very useful uh, trait of that orbit because you can then stay constantly in radio or television touch with the spot on the ground below. Earth orbit is the natural extension of Earth's occupation in space. And if future plans pan out, the industrialization of the edge of space will happen in the near future.
it was only 40 years ago John Glenn entered Earth orbit. What the next 50 or 100 years holds for the future of Earth orbit is as exciting as perhaps a walk on the moon once was to an older generation. Bigelow Aerospace has already reached a major milestone by launching their Genesis 1 and 2 pods into orbit. But future spacecraft will be ready for private citizens. Nobody's done this before. I mean, the people have gone to space, but what we're trying to do is make it available. It's called Sundancer, a 300 cubic meter inhabitable space that will have the capacity to support up to three human lives indefinitely. We have to add a lot of life support equipment to make sure that the environment is sustainable for a crew of three. That goes into anything from the air concentration uh, system where oxygen has to be delivered, CO2 has to get removed, all the way through uh, more rigorous thermal control and humidity control. One Sundancer spacecraft offers more space than is currently available on the entire International Space Station. Eventually, multiple pods will be connected together, like Tinker Toys, for larger facilities. What kind of shape you're choosing depends on the purpose, the mission for the spacecraft. But like pioneers setting off across the open sea in search of new land, this is uncharted territory. We have an opportunity to turn that vision into a reality. And so far, that's exactly what we're doing. They are one group of many that dream of permanent occupancy at the edge of space. One thing remains clear. Earth needs an easy way to deliver spacecraft, cargo, and people into space to take advantage of Earth orbit. And the ideas are spectacular. There have been all kinds of concepts, like space elevators. How about a space fountain? A highly energized wave of particles that lifts cargo up into Earth orbit. The key is finding a cheap way to get those materials up to space. Or perhaps the resources of space can be mined in a facility orbiting Earth. Using the resources that are on the moon and the asteroids nearby to build things in space themselves, not have to spend the money to haul them up from the ground. For example, Lewis and Clark, when they went across the continental US, they didn't haul all their drinking water and firewood with them from St. Louis on the way west. They used what they found along the way. Earth orbit's greatest gift might be sustainable power. Imagine an array of solar panels that generates enough power to light up a continent. That's probably one of the most promising avenues to pursue in the next 50 years in space is to find a way to make cheap solar collectors and then build the collecting antennas on the ground so that we can use uh, inexhaustible solar power to reduce our reliance on the finite supplies of fuel and energy we have here on Earth. One thing is certain, the edge of space is the entryway to future exploration a stopping point to the destinations across the universe. I'm very excited about a future, decades from now, where the Earth really is the Garden of Eden of humanity, where we've taken care of our planet, our parks, our enjoyment, and the things that we love about the Earth are taken care of. And all the things that we do in terms of manufacturing and resource extraction and energy and mining, those things take place in space. And of course, low Earth orbit is the gateway to the rest of the solar system.